And the first uh, session is from engineer, Dr. Christopher To. May I invite Dr. To on the stage? <laughs> Dr. Christopher To is an accredited mediator, accredited adjudicator, chartered arbitrator, chartered engineer, chartered information technology professional, and a barrister at law. He has arbitrated a variety of international cases involving both ad hoc and inst institutional arbitrations, mediated and adjudicated many international and domestic cases, and has represented clients as counsel in cases at the magistrate, district, and high courts, the commissioner of inquiry, disciplinary proceedings, as well as in international arbitrations and mediations. As former Secretary General of the, of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, engineer Dr. To managed to elevate Hong Kong's status as the regional dispute resolution hub of Asia, as well as creating the Asian Domain Name Dispute Resolution Center, a body that has gained international prominence within the dot-com community as a reliable and reputable entity that manages domain name disputes. His topic today is, can adjudication cure all disputes within the construction industry? Thank you. Not at all. Okay. Thank you, Albert. Uh, President uh, Edwin, uh, Cindy Tong, Chairman, as well as committee members, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I decided to choose this topic. Why? But usually people praise people up. You do not usually want to go to someone who's always negative. I decided I want to use this topic, this title called, Can Adjudication Cure All Disputes Within the Construction Industry? Question mark. The answer is why? Because some disputes might not be suitable for adjudication. So that's why I've raised this topic, because most people are singing the hymns by saying that adjudication can help you resolve all your disputes. I remember when I was doing mediation, everyone said the same thing. Mediation can help you resolve all your disputes. And when I turned around and said to this person, what about criminal acts? And they kept quiet. Okay, now, if you look at here, you can see, for example, adjudication. People say, what is it? So I've highlighted, this is where I've taken this from. It's the Buildings Dispute Tribunal of New Zealand. I've taken this definition, and it says that it's a private, confidential, uh, unpaid invoices, defective works, conducted entirely on documents bound by the outcome. So those are the key words. So the key thing here is, if you look very carefully here, it doesn't say it's quick, cost-effective, and so forth. It just focuses on the key words here. So at the end of the day, don't assume that adjudication is going to be cheaper than other methods of dispute resolution. The cheapest method of dispute resolution, ladies and gentlemen, is negotiation. It is cheap, okay? But are you willing to do negotiation? Usually your emotions come into play. You do not focus on the issues. So that's why you have to put aside the emotions, focus on the matter at hand, and resolve it. Because life is too short, okay? But some disputes have to go to other forms of dispute resolution simply because the key word everyone talks about, accountability. That's it. You have to be accountable. You have to tell the world why you've gone through this process. But if you are a one-man band with the other person who's a one-man band company, the answer is you might as well sit down and negotiate. Now, if you look at here, what is adjudication appropriate for? Interim payments, delayed disruptions, extensions of time, defective works, final account, breach of contract, termination of contract, and I put the very last one, professional negligence, okay? But usually you don't really handle professional negligence so much in this part of the region, but other regions you do. So you can see, this is the scope in terms of what adjudication can help you to resolve. Now, People talk about the good things. I remember when I was in Scotland, my, my first job was to sell vacuum cleaners. That was my first job, I told everyone, because I wanted to do a part-time job, okay? I was bored at home studying, because in Scotland, very, very quiet. So I decided to do a part-time job. So I decided to sell vacuum cleaners. You go to knock on the door and you tell someone, please buy my vacuum cleaner. The old lady will say, I've already got one. Why do I need a new one? So the, the, the chances are everyone tells you the good things. And she turned around and said to me, 
tell me what your vacuum cleaner can do that my vacuum cleaner cannot do. And I scratched my head and says, what type of vacuum cleaner is that? I couldn't answer the question. So the advantages, okay, is here. Quick determination, okay, quick injection of cash, which all subcontractors are concerned, because cash is king. Everyone talks about that. Streamline the process of determination, quick, because in litigation like MT knows, we have a lot of discovery, okay, pleadings and so forth. Another one is, uh, they say you don't have to wait until, for example, arbitration before you get paid, which I'll tell you, which the Development Bureau has defined it very accurately in terms of how you get paid. Final determination, I'm not so sure because you can still go to arbitration or litigation, depending on how you draft the contract. Another one is party autonomy. Can you choose the adjudicator? Now, you can, but given the time frame we have in terms of appointing an adjudicator, five days, difficult. Okay, so the chances are, if you have a longer time frame to appoint someone, the chances are you can choose people that you think have the right quality and competence to do the work. Now, the adjudicator, people talk about, you just sit there and listen or uh, receive submissions. But sometimes in the rules, you actually have inquisitorial. What does that mean? That means you can go and investigate. You can find out. You can ask parties for more information. So you have that. Limited submissions, I can tell you, MT knows, no matter what we do things, they always have late submissions, last minute submissions, and so forth. Do you reject them? The answer is if you do, then it could be a challenge. So chances are you have to balance it very carefully. The other one is no cross-examination. Yes, if you don't have a hearing. So you can't really cross-examine. So if someone, the respondent, the person who's responding to the claim, says something that's not true, can you respond to it? The answer is yes, you can put in a submission, but does that have any weight? It might do, it might not do. Another one is rules of evidence do not apply. Okay, you're going to submit anything. Okay, another one is no risk of paying the other side's uh, costs. What, what are we talking about that? Legal costs, experts' costs, because people are worried if I lose, I have to pay their costs. Okay, another one is confidential. The answer is provided the rules, provided the law has provisions to cover for confidentiality. If not, it's not really confidential. Now, sorry, let's go. When people talk about adjudication, my first adjudication I did, I had so many documents, I didn't know what to do. Okay, it took me a long time. So there's all these different documents they have to do, look at, within a very short period of time. Is it sensible? Can you do it? Another thing is, if you look at the web page, I went to a web page to find out about some diagram about adjudication. I could not find a single one about adjudication. All I can find is prevention, negotiation, mediation, arbitration, litigation. So adjudication is in between mediation and arbitration. So you can see that it's not that popular internationally. People talk about it, yes, it's very popular in England, Ireland, Malaysia, Singapore, New Zealand, Australia, and the Commonwealth part of countries, but it's not so popular in other countries. But in saying that, I found out recently, Thailand is now considering enacting a law on adjudication. Okay, so for some kind of security of payment. Now, the disadvantages. People talk about rough justice. What's that? One example is, you're the claimant, the person submitting the claim. You have umpteen days to prepare. The respondent only has 20 days. If you produce thousands and thousands of documents, how can someone with 20 days prepare their response? Practically impossible. Okay, you need to actually hire lots of lawyers, work midnight, 24 hours in order to produce that document. And on top of that, you need engineers to give the input to the lawyers. That's another issue. Now, limited scope and jurisdiction. Whatever the contract says that you have scope to determine, that's it. Can you go outside it? The answer is no, because if you do, you're ultra-virus, outside your scope. The other one is, the referring part is the element of surprise. Why? They might serve it to you when you're basically having your, say, uh, party or something, or your annual meetings and so forth, and suddenly you don't have much time to do it. The other one is, uh, jurisdictional challenges. People talk about two things, the basis and the threshold. 
Okay, we're not just talking about challenging you. What is the basis for it? And how, what is the level you can actually say this is a good challenge or not a good challenge? Okay, another one is does not always lead to final settlement of the dispute. You go to arbitration litigation. Legal costs or expert costs are not normally recoverable. As a result of mistakes can therefore cost significantly little margin of error. Another one is mistaken decisions has to be honored in the short term. Whether you like it or not, it's a mistake, you still have to honor it, which may cause issues of cash flows. You still have to pay. There is no testing of evidence or assertions. Whatever they submit, you just have to contradict it or whatever, okay? Outcome is decided within 55 days, okay? A rough way of determining crucial contentions. Last one is difficulty of challenging the adjudicator's decision. The only way you can do that is in court, but usually the judge will say, was he biased? Was he impartial? Was he independent? Did, did he follow due process? If you can't challenge any of those, or he did not take into consideration certain evidence, the judge says, that is outside my scope. So chances are, this is the negative side of adjudication, which most people don't tell you, okay? But in saying that, I still buy adjudication. Why do I buy adjudication? The answer is because it is quick. Because most people, especially small, medium-sized enterprises, require cash flow. And the person at the top doesn't want to give you it so quickly or negotiate because they're accountable to someone else. So if someone in the middle decides that you get your money to finish the project, so if you eventually go to arbitration and you have to pay it back, at least you have the money to move forward with the project. So in a way, it is good. Now, jurisdiction, we talk about that. Internal, it is rare nature. You fail to apply the contractual terms, you went out, outside your scope, okay? The statutory provisions allow you to actually focus on these, but you went outside. Very rare, because most adjudicators who get trained competently know that their jurisdiction is crucial. Next one is the threshold. Someone will challenge your jurisdiction, should I proceed? Okay, when someone challenges you, you tend to be a bit edgy. Look at things very carefully. The other one is, uh, do you want to resign? That's the easy route, resign. Get someone else to do it. The last one is, for example, is the challenge basically substantiated? If you agree that basically there's no challenge, eventually they might challenge you at the very end in arbitration, that your decision is not good. I wouldn't say wrong, okay? Now, the threshold, what do you have to look at? Is there a contract? Are the parties to the contract the same parties who are bringing the adjudication? Now look at the court cases in Hong Kong. Some of the names are not cited pro properly. So you have to make sure, does the appointment comply with the requirements? Contractual provisions, because if you don't follow the procedure, that is a procedural requirement, which the adjudication decision could be set aside. Another one, if not, does the contract fall within the ambit of Construction Act? This is from UK, you can see at the bottom. I've taken this from the surveyors acting as adjudicators in the construction industry, fourth edition, January 2017. And it says, does it fall within the ambit of the law? Has the appointment been in accordance with applicable procedure, including the appropriate AMB? Last but not least, crucial. Has there been a crystallization of the dispute? Has a dispute actually occurred? It's just that you disagree with the other side, but has there been a dispute? Did parties disagree? Just like an offer, counter offer, and, and so forth. Now, when we talk about adjudication, I've identified right here. You basically claim under the contract, crystallization of the dispute, serve the notice, select the appointment adjudicator, then after challenge the adjudicator's decision or jurisdiction, serve the submissions, serve the reply in any documents or submissions, further investigation by the adjudicator, receive the adjudicator's decision, enforcement, and also challenge the enforcement. So that is roughly the scope when you talk about adjudication. So whenever you're drafting rules, these should be covered. Maybe the last one, not so, because this is usually the court proceedings, but all of these should be covered. Now, if you look at, for example, and this is from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. So you can see that, for example, they do have, for example, so think boxes for you to think about. If I go to adjudication, what do I do? Okay, I take, like, name the specific adjudicator, 
and so forth. So they actually teach you when you go through adjudication process. Now, people are concerned about time is money. The notice of adjudication, no dates, working dates. Why? You can spend a whole year working on it. Okay? The appointment adjudicator, under the current rules of uh, the AMB, is five days. The summation, one day. The response from the respondent, sometimes the claimant is referred to as the referring party, and sometimes the respondent is referred to as the responding party, depending on the rules. Then the decision, you have to render it from okay, the appointment. Then after that, enforcement decision, it depends. Depends on what? One issue is the limitations ordinance. Now, I just want to show you the history. Can you see that diagram there, 2001? When I started as a young man, I'm, a, I'm an old man now, that was when adjudication was discussed and I was there. And now we've reached 2021, whereby there's a development bureau, I say draft circular, but it's now been issued. So you can see that it took from 2001 to 2021. How many years, ladies and gentlemen? 20 years, nearly, 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 uh, nearly 25 years, uh, return, return of Hong Kong to China, China. So 25 years. So you can see it took 20 odd years before we actually come to flotation now with some kind of public document relating to public works adjudication. And we haven't covered the private sector. So my gut feeling is it might go to 25 years. Okay, so I'm not sure. Okay, it really depends on development bureau whether they're willing to push it. Okay, this is this is sometimes you have to bite uh, bite the bite the bullet and move move forward. Okay. Now, the security payment regime under the development bureau. There's there's a technical circular. This is for public works only, not for private works. Public works only. Now, if you go to that website, you'll find it. You see here there are certain parameters I've identified here which are very good. First one is due dates. Okay, I won't, I'm not going to read the box, but the due dates are very important. You must follow them. Next one is conditional payments, paid when paid. Oh, the employer hasn't paid me, the main contractor, so the main contractor, I cannot pay you the subcontractor. This goes away. Okay, if you sign a contract, you've done the work, the other side has to pay. This is an obligation under contract. Okay, another one is referral to adjudication. If there's a dispute, you refer to adjudication. Another one is suspension goes slow. If you don't pay, if the adjudicator rules in your favor, you can suspend works. Okay? Previously, if you try to suspend works, the chances are you could be sued. Okay? So the chances are you as a subcontractor could be in a difficult position. So that's why these are the four criteria that I found useful about the public works uh, uh, sort of SOP, security payment regime for public works. Now, oh, the key aspects of the circle, I'm not going to read all this. Prohibition, pay when pay, uh, not, not allowed. Submission to claim the time frames. Response within 30 days. And uh, if you admit any, uh, any amount, you have to pay it within 60 days. Refer to uh, adjudication, a determination by adjudicator by 55 days. Okay, pay by must pay the amount within 30 days. If not, there are two options. If you don't pay within the, the, the 30 days, once the adjudicator has decided or you agreed, then there's two options. One is called suspension work, another one is called direct payment. Now, why do we have this? Because under the public works regime, we can't go to court. Okay, courts will not enforce it. That's why we need to have two regimes. One is suspension, one is called direct payment. Okay, so if you look at the very bottom, I try to give you this. How many cases have gone to courts in UK in 2019 to 2020? This is the technology court Construction Court in UK gave a report, this is the latest report, 133 cases okay, went to court for enforcement. So you might say, not a lot. Okay, yes, not a lot. But how many cases did go to adjudication? Quite a lot. So you can see that not everyone goes to enforcement. Usually, employers, main contractors would just pay up. Or they might go into arbitration, depending on the situation. Now, the regime. The regime currently has for public works only applies to government contracts. Okay, adjudication decisions are not enforceable for the courts, but the new legislation basically will cover public, uh, private, public and private works, 
new construction contracts existing 5 million, contracts for the supply of related goods and services over 500,000 Hong Kong dollars, as well as the decisions of adjudicators will be enforceable in the courts. Okay, Hong Kong courts, okay? Now, this is how the whole process goes. Okay, step one, you make a claim, and the respondent pays the issues payment and pays the full amount, great. After 3A, you're finished. If not, you go to uh, 2B. Respondent does, not, uh, does one of the following, disputes the claim amount, admits the claim, and you go down again. There is a payment dispute which begin, began on the day of the payment response was served. Then after that payment uh, dispute rises, within 20 days, you serve the notice. Then after that, within that, then you commence adjudication. Then you appoint the adjudicator. Then after that, then the claimant serves as adjudication summation. So you can see that these are the dates I've tried to identify for you. And after that, then the respondent uh, re uh, replies to the response. Then after the, uh, the adjudicator makes a decision within 55 days. And last but not least, step nine is enforcement. Okay, so we don't have to go to enforcement. Usually parties will willingly agree to honor the obligations of the adjudicator. So that is the steps. I've run through it very quickly. The reason is to tell you the step-by-step -step process. Now, remember we talked about those two payments. One is called direct payment. And someone said leap for again. You leap. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, so for example, the second tier and the third tier, you have a dispute, you don't pay and so forth. You can go to the employer, the employer will pay you directly. And after that, they'll deduct the amount from the main contractor. And like, likewise, the main contractor will deduct it from the first tier subcontractor and so forth. So this is what we call leapfrogging. Instead of waiting for you to get paid by the second tier subcontractor. So that's one way of doing it. So it's much easier for you to understand. But, ladies and gentlemen, the development bill will have to have an office, have to have people there to monitor documentation. So this is another issue about documentation management. Okay, so you really have to have very good documentation, like even electronic documents, so that, for example, if anything goes wrong, you can show the documents very quickly. If not, the chances are you will find it difficult to get paid because you have to verify, because government wants documents. But the main contractor, if they sign any subcontracts, they must give copies to this office in the Development Bureau. Now, the suspension rights. Okay, so you can see that. If you look at here, adjudicate uh, uh, unpaid for 30 days or more, claimants gives notice of intention to suspend or delay progress. You can't just suddenly say, I'm stopping work and leave. You have to give a notice. Then claimant takes reasonable steps to give notice and is still unpaid after five days. Claimant imposes suspension or delay to progress. Claimant resumes work within seven days of receiving payment. So you can see that if you don't pay within a certain amount, 30 days, I give you notice. Five days don't pay, I stop work. If you pay, I don't immediately start work, I wait seven days. So this will give you some indication, so for example, that if you're the subcontractor, if you walk away and, and stop work, the chances are you must follow a process. You can't just say, tools down, disappear from the site. Okay, so that, that is the process you have to go through. Now, A and Bs, this is from UK. I only can get data up to 212. Uh, if you look at the number of A and Bs, the, the adjudicated nominating bodies, the highest number of appointments come from the organization which you're all familiar with, Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Look at the high number. Can you see those? If they are, if they are. No, 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 no. Okay, see the numbers at the top? So you can see a lot. Okay, so for example, even the other organization, ICE, very low. Okay, now this was taken from a research proposal done by the Adjudication Society, okay, uh, which, I, which I was privileged of getting because the, the university is from Glasgow Caledonian University, which I'm associated with. They actually basically produce this data. UK, not Hong Kong. Now, this is more precise. 2018, 2019, 2020, much more detailed. Lawyers, 42%. Quantity surveyors, 347 Civil engineers, 7.4 President, see? We are, this is UK. The other one is architects, 6.4. Construction consultants, 2. CILB builders, 2%. Others could be, for example, maybe uh, uh, claims consultants, whatever, whatever, I, I don't know. Okay, I, I don't know what they, 
any others, okay? Catch all. So you can see that lawyers still take the precedence. Why is that? Because it's all a legal process. Remember adjudication at the very beginning of the definition? Remember I said New Zealand? They never mentioned about legal process. But it's a legal process. So people, some people prefer not to get involved because it's, you can get challenged, okay? Okay, for discipline and all that other stuff. So if you do something wrong, then you might, someone might send a letter to Prof, uh, President Edwin and say that you discipline you and you have to have a discipline committee and all that stuff. So lots of problems. So people tend to be, technical people tend to be a bit shy away from these kind of legal processes. But lawyers are not, because MT knows we handle cases inside out. Okay? I used to be scared of going to court when I was a young boy. I'm not so scared now. No, I, I, it's scary for you, but not for me. They scare you. No, it depends on the judge. Some judges are very nice. But some judges, you have to be a bit careful. Now, why have I given you this? This is from the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. People always say that adjudication, the skill sets, the competency level, it's not so, people talk about five-day training. But if you look at arbitration compared to mediation, you still have to go through all these training processes. It's not easy, okay? Now, most people basically find that adjudication pretty easy. The key is you go through the training. Doesn't mean you're finished, full stop. There's one term called continuum professional development. Not because you have to go to the in institution of engineers, it's you have to have your own CPD. What does that mean? Studying the latest case law, understanding what's the current trend. So that when it comes to a case, you have 55 days to do it, you don't have to go and search information. You already know the latest trend. So that's very important. So you can see that the competency level to be trained as an adjudicator is not lighter than arbitration. It's the same. Now, let's take the whole world. Okay, Hong Kong, UK, New South Wales, Western Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Singapore. Legislation, except for Hong Kong, none. I always say, why does Hong Kong not have any legislation? And I always tell everyone in international conferences, because we are conservative. We wait and see. You make a mistake, we learn from your mistakes. <laughs> okay? So you can see that ability to contract out of the adjudication, you cannot. Pay when pay, you cannot. Direct payment, we have. So you know about this, leapfrogging. You can pay directly. We have it. Malaysia, Singapore has it. The others don't have it. Other one is suspension goes slow. Yes. Now, if you go down here, the time frames. I'm not going to read all this. So you can see all the time frames here. People always say, oh, Hong Kong is very tough in terms of time frame. Look at the others. They're even tougher. Okay? So the chances are we're okay. Of course, as lawyers, MT myself will know that we need more time. Everyone needs more time to prepare. Unfortunately, you, all the time you have is, that's it, 55 days. Now, just to finish there, I just want to say that even though I said it's adjudication suitable for all disputes, the answer is some disputes, no, as I said early on. But the key thing about adjudication is if you manage your documentation, manage your dispute effectively, the key word is you will save in terms of efficiency and cost. If you don't at the very beginning, this is front end, the chances are you will suffer at the back end. Whether you like it or not, in construction disputes, okay, you might say, I don't have any construction disputes. Some companies will say, I, 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 we don't have any. But put it this way, the chances are some people might sue you. You don't know. So the chances are having right documentation is crucial. So the, the bad thing about adjudication compared to arbitration and mediation is engineers, I used to be an engineer, we're not so good at documentation. We're too busy trying to build. Documentation comes later for auditing purposes once the project's finished. But now you have to focus on having the documentation produced concurrently while you're building the project. So that if a dispute happens, you don't have to put everything down in your project. You can just submit the documents to the lawyers. They can study it. They prepare the submissions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's my note on it. I'm not saying it's negative. I think it's positive going forward. But the key thing is people have to be more proactive in managing their disputes.
Okay, you can't just dump everything on, for example. Oh, I forgot, uh, uh, Muxer is also a barrister here. <laughs> so he knows, okay? He's not afraid to go to court as well. So uh, there are quite a few barristers in this room, but the chances are, I, I feel, for example, end of the day is about management, proactive management. Okay, each dispute resolution process has its good points and bad points. But the key is whether you are committed to using that process to your advantage. On that note, President Sydney, thank you very much for inviting me, and I hope this is not too negative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Very uh, inspiring talk. And uh, we'll now start the question and answer sessions, and uh, please remain on stage. Now, uh, for both the on-site and uh, uh, Zoom uh, participants, you can scan this code now uh, on, the, on the screen, and you can uh, prepare your questions through the chat room. Chris, there are already two questions uh, so quick. there. And uh, the first one is, is that as adjudication is relatively new in Hong Kong, what is your advice to our fellow engineers and other construction practitioners to get prepared for or take advantage from this mechanism? And I would like to add, apart from fellow engineers, what can Hong Kong IE and the CDLC do to sort of uh, promote this mechanism? Uh, thank you, Albert. I, I think under the leadership of Edwin and also Sydney uh, from HKI, they're doing a lot in terms of this area. They're providing some training courses. And I think everyone in the committee is very dedicated in terms of doing this. But the key thing is about, not about providing the service. We can provide the service. But whether the person wants to commit to use that service, that's very important. Uh, the key thing is, are you committed? Now, you might say, I don't get involved with disputes. This is for the lawyers. Now, look at the statistics I showed you early on. If you don't get involved, eventually, what will happen is all the lawyers will, will take it over. Okay, I shouldn't say that because I, I'm a lawyer. Okay, good for me. But unfortunately, I, I feel that some disputes are more suitable for technical individuals to handle. Some more disputes relating to contractual interpretation are more suitable for the lawyers to handle. So it really depends on the type of dispute. So my feeling is, if you can provide a service which a customer likes, the chance that you're doing a good service to society. Okay. Uh, sometimes when you go to court, I remember uh, the same with MT and also Muxer, you know, whenever you, you explain something to the judge, the judge says, I don't understand, can you explain it simplistically, please? Maybe with a diagram to show me each point, how things move. Okay, so the chances are sometimes because judges are not trained as technical individuals, they're trained as legal experts. So chances are having that skill is important. Last but not least, I always regret it, okay, why? Uh, learning when you're young is easy. When you get old, to put everything in your brain is very difficult. So those young members, if you really want a career in this area, start young, okay? You, they all, you're always telling me, that, oh, I'm very busy, but put it this way, I, I, MT knows, I, I was do, and also just Albert knows, I was working full time traveling the world for an airline. On top of that, I was studying arbitration uh, at nighttime and so forth, I, if I can do it, the chances are you can do it. It's just a commitment, that's all. Of course, family comes first. I always believe that. <laughs> yeah, I hope that, that um, at least engineers in Hong Kong can more, get more than 7.4% from the statistics, unlike in, in the UK, only 7.4%. I hope we can get a bit more. And uh, we believe that um, adjudication is very suitable for uh, engineers because time is uh, short and uh, we are conversant with the details and we are the professional uh, doing the professional disputes. So the second question is uh, every adjudicator will be interested to know is what is the liability of an adjudicator? As an adjudicator, what precautionary measures we should have the liability? Now, let's look at arbitration. Arbitration, uh, if you look at the legislation, Chapter 609, some people will know here. Yeah, can you remember the provisions? Anyone? Vivian? Okay, the provisions in the law ordinance say very clearly that unless you're dishonest, you cannot be sued whatsoever. Okay, so the chances are you have a provision for arbitration. Mediation, you don't have that provision. But the key thing in mediation is you're not giving advice. 
Uh, but people are promoting mediation as not facilitative anymore, but evaluative, very risky. If you are a lawyer, you're covered because you, you have your own insurance coverage through the bar association, the law society. But if you're not, and you're a technical person, it turns out you need to buy insurance if you give evaluative mediation because professional indemnity is very important. And adjudication, we don't have that, okay? Unless you adopt it within the rules. So Sam, where are you? I can't see you. The light's shining here. Can you see? Okay. Oh, you're standing over there. So basically, that's why I, I emphasize, Sam, isn't it? We have some element like the arbitration ordinance within the HKIE adjudication rules because trying to buy in professional indemnity insurance in Hong Kong, it is not cheap. Very expensive. So ladies and gentlemen, that's why always look at the rules. Always look at the law. If the law basically gives you exclusion, provided you're not dishonest, then you're okay. But if the law says it's silent and the rules are silent, you might think about getting some insurance. If not, the chances are you do not know. Some people might take it differently and sue you. The chances are you have to be a bit careful on that point. Okay? So that's something that you have to be aware of. So I think that whenever you're getting involved with adjudication, first thing is don't automatically accept the appointment. People always say, oh, my first case, great. First thing I do nowadays is, yes, you send me an appointment. The first thing is send me the uh, contract, send me the rules. I look at those before I even respond. Before I even look at the third thing, whether I have any conflict of interest, okay? Because that's very important because if you don't have some kind of coverage yourself and you believe that you can do it, you can actually suffer in the long run. Okay. Like things happen, you don't know. Good. Uh, at least uh, we hope that, uh, like uh, arbitrators, this is more or less adjudicator can be of the only profession that will not be sued, all right? Engineers are being sued, barristers are being sued, doctors are being sued. Hopefully, then uh, adjudicator provided, like what Chris said, if you do not do things dishonestly, you are protected. Another question is, with the cases being confidential for adjudication, how can we, as engineers, learn through the case law? Now, I think more, if you look at, for example, uh, the legislation, if the legislation says it's confidential, clearly it's confidential. If the rules or the government procedure say it's confidential, then it's confidential. But if they're silent, the chances are, then it might be able to actually access some of the adjudication decisions. Now, but in saying that, usually parties, if you ask them whether they're willing to waive that confidentiality, some parties will say yes. Now, you might say, if it's all confidential, I can't even show it to my accountant. Okay, yes, you can, because certain exemptions require that you must, because of statutory requirements, that you must disclose information. But in saying that, where you can learn information from, as I said earlier on, Albert, case law. Now, there are many websites, okay? I even, I'm not gonna mention the websites in case I have to promote them, Sydney. Uh, the websites basically have a lot of case law. And every day, uh, the first thing I, I do in the morning if I don't have cases, basically I sit there and actually go through the case law. Now, you might say that I read them all from the very beginning to the very end, the answer is I'm not very diligent. Okay, I usually just read the summary. Because why? So many cases, you don't have time. So once you find that this case is interesting, that you want to read more, then you read more. Okay? Because some of the cases do not just touch on one element of adjudication, it might touch on other elements relating to insolvency and so forth, so which you're not interested in. So why read the whole case? So I think case law is very important. The other most important thing that you must do is register with lawyer, law, law firms to get their newsletters. Because the, the law, law firm's newsletters are superb. Why? They focus on the crucial points of the case. Okay? I was going to read, uh, I, what I can mention is, King Group Mullisons. Why? Because uh, I'm sitting with uh, Paul Starr in an international committee at this moment in time looking at adjudication because we're trying to formulate a new set of law internationally, one law for adjudication around the world. Similar to the New York, similar to the United Nations Convention on uh, uh, Arbitration, the model law. So we're going to do the same for adjudication, so that everything is consistent all the way through. 
So you do this boost in Hong Kong, if they adopt it, Singapore they adopt it, it's the same. Thank you. So I think there will be time for two more questions. Wow. Uh, that's the uh, second last one is uh, somebody asked, it seems that there are few ENM engineers being arbitrator stroke adjudicator and involving in the dispute resolution mechanism. Chris, you are ENM engineers, I believe. Yes, what is I your am. view for the ENM engineers? Uh, my view is, of course, uh, if, I, if I'm very self, uh, selfish, I would say don't get involved because yeah. <laughs> all the cases come to me. Yes, but at the end of the day, Trust me, I am busy, okay? I'm busy, they, they know I'm busy. The chances are I do want to develop uh, sort of a succession planning. Why do I spend time teaching in universities? It's no fun, isn't it, Vivian? <laughs> no fun, okay, but at the end of the day, why? The only purpose I teach in universities is that we need to have succession planning. We need to have people who can take over your role in the future because you're not gonna be here all the time. So that's very important. Now, e &M engineers, actually have more work than I would say civil engineers. Why am I saying this? How many disputes now are involving computer science? Quite a lot. I handle quite a lot. The chances are, but civil engineers cannot focus on computer science, it's a different concept. e &M engineers can. Okay, so chances are computer science, everything to do with computer technology, Hong Kong is now focusing on innovation, so there is a vast amount of contracts going to be drafted for innovative designs. They're going to have arbitration. They're not going to have litigation. Remember what you said, Albert, confidentiality. Litigation is not confidential, it's public. Unless you request from the court in cold store chambers hearing, if not, it's public. Arbitration is confidential. So most of the lawyers will advise them to go to arbitration. So there is an opportunity there. So if, there, if there's 100 cases that go to innovation, uh, contract drafting, even 10%, 10 cases, that's 10 e &M engineers. Okay, so that, I think that there are opportunities there. And I always believe that don't just learn one subject, learn multiple subjects. And uh, majority of my disputes now are focused on finance. As I was telling Mandy, I, I didn't have a clue about finance, margin trading and all that stuff. Okay, I didn't have a clue. I'm pretty good at uh, financial disputes now, the terminology, at least I know. So if I want to invest in future, I know what those terms are. So, so with, with that, I think you have to diversify. You can't just focus on one area. Thank you. So the last question is, somebody asked, uh, NEC stipulates adjudication for dispute resolution. So does the uh, SOP bill but given the frequent use of adjudication in future, would the lack of legislation in adjudication in Hong Kong hinder the enforcement of adjudication decisions, especially like cross-border cases in the Greater Bay Area? Now, I think in future going forward, I think that uh, Ricky, uh, which I've worked with before uh, many years, for two years, I think he's committed to actually having this SOPL uh, in, in terms of implemented very soon and hopefully by next year, we should have an SOPL in place. So my, my feeling is just wait, wait and see, we're waiting for nearly 20 years, okay? Another year won't kill us, okay? Uh, end of the day, so I think by next year, I think we should have an SOPL now. But the key thing here is once we have the SOPL, usually if you look at statistics from Singapore, Malaysia and all these places, the first year you don't have much cases. The second year, you have a lot of cases, okay? Because people are testing the water. But usually when you have a case, you have spend a lot of time preparing for it. So chances are you might actually engage more engineers or more lawyers to assist you preparing the case if you do not have the right management tools in place to manage your contracts. So that is something that I would say going forward. Hong Kong, I think is committed. Uh, I remember I went to a meeting two months ago with uh, Sydney and also some of the members here. And uh, we went and there was a deputy secretary. Wow, he was very determined <laughs> to actually push this forward. He, he practically said, this is my mandate before I return to another uh, government department. So I think, I think government's committed. So uh, whether you like it, ladies and gentlemen, it's coming. Uh, we're the last of the last. 
we can't say to the world that it's a previous Commonwealth jurisdiction. All the Commonwealth jurisdictions have adopted it, except for Hong Kong. Even though we're not a Commonwealth jurisdiction now, but we're still a common law jurisdiction. So even Thailand is now adopting new law. So I think we should be doing the same. Thank you very much. So uh, a very interesting and uh, uh, insightful talk. And uh, may we uh, thank Dr. To in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you.